The title of this evening's Bible study is Give Me a Fighter. And I'm going to be talking about Joshua. Joshua was the man who got to do what Moses did not get to do. Joshua is the man who got to do what Moses was not allowed to do. And Joshua followed Moses as the leader of God's people, and I seriously doubt that anybody would say that Joshua was greater than Moses. But Joshua was completely different than Moses, and God asked him to be completely different than Moses and to do different things and to lead Israel into being a conquering people. Joshua was not Moses' son, and, and we cannot help but wonder why God did not choose a child of Moses to lead Israel. After Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and led them for 40 years in the wilderness, you wonder sometimes why Gershom or Elizer did not step into their father's position and lead Israel on to victory. What we do know is this, that they both seem to be absent in critical moments. When we see Joshua at the feet of Moses or at the foot of the mountain, we don't see Moses' sons there. Joshua seemed to be present during most of the events, and he took a stand to be as close as he could be to Moses. Consider, for example, the incident involving Eldad and Medad, the ones who prophesied in the camp. The Bible says this in Numbers chapter 11, verse 26. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And so we see Joshua was there, and Joshua responds. He says, my Lord Moses forbid them. Moses stopped them from prophesying in the camp. And Moses responds to Joshua. He says, envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. What I want you to see is that Joshua was there to protect Moses. Apparently, Eldad and Medad were spiritual men, but Joshua was jealous and envious but not for himself. He was jealous and envious for Moses' sake. He wanted Moses to be the one speaking to the people. Joshua wanted to protect Moses. Joshua wanted to promote Moses. And, and there is something about a person who wants to protect his or her leader. There's something about a man or a woman who says, I want to be there for them. I want to take care of them. And Joshua took a stand for his spiritual leader, Moses. And you and I, we need to do and we should do the exact same thing. You see, when you protect the person of leadership whom God placed in your life, you're not doing it as much for that person as you are doing it for yourself. Because God turns and blesses you for strengthening or helping or supporting the leadership. Never, ever let people talk badly about the ministry. I realize I'm the pastor here, but the pastor should never be what's for dinner. And for that matter, the pastor's wife and the pastor's children should not be what's for dinner. Amen. 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 And if people are talking about any ministry, not just me, any ministry, yeah. rebuke them. Yeah. Kindly, sweetly, gently, just tell them, we don't do that. Yeah. We don't do that. Amen. Ministers are not perfect. And protecting the ministry is significantly more about you than it is about the minister you protect. That's right. Because when you protect me or some other minister, God is watching you do that. And God covers you and God rewards you when you do that. God blesses you when you do that. And we can see that in the life of Joshua. Joshua protected Moses and it did more for Joshua than it ever did for Moses. 
Joshua needed Moses and protecting Moses and blessing Moses more than Moses needed Joshua. Look at Numbers 11, 29. You see, for years Moses had worked on his own heart and he had schooled himself against the sin of jealousy. So now you have this old saying of, of God who can simply reply to Joshua and say this, Envy is now for my sake. You're jealous for me. You're jealous on behalf of me. And, and so Moses is telling Joshua, I, I'm glad you're doing this and I appreciate it. And you see, Joshua tried to protect Moses. And he most certainly should have done that. But Moses was also able to use that event to teach Joshua that he was strong and that he was confident and that everything was going to be okay. That he didn't have to jump to arms every time something happened. Right. He wanted Joshua to see sometimes it's okay. Joshua was able to get a personal example of his hero Moses in action. He was able to see Moses doing what God called Moses to do. The Bible says in Exodus 17, it said, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in, in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass that when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. But when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. He was tired. He was weak. And so they took a stone and they put it under Moses. And he sat there on him. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And as a result of this, Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And so Moses did that. Moses built an altar, and he called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord had sworn that the Lord will have woe with Amalek from generation to generation. So when the Amaleks began their invasion against Israel, Moses, he went and he looked for a warrior. He would look for someone who could lead Israel down in the valley fighting against the Amalekites while Moses went up to the hilltop. Moses needed someone he could trust to stay in the valley, to stay in the fight, the physical fight, the fight of the flesh, Moses needed someone who would take up his sword and go sword to sword with the enemy while Moses went up to the mountaintop and prayed and did spiritual warfare. And because Moses knew that Joshua trusted him, believed in him, and that Moses knew that Joshua would obey him, Moses chose Joshua to go fight in the valley. So this is a typology of Scripture. Amalek in the valley represents flesh. And we see Amalek in ourselves when we behave irrationally. We see Amalek in ourselves when we lose our temper or when we react with anger. We, we see Amalek in ourselves when we're insulted and, and we don't handle it well or we attack other people. We see Amalek in ourselves when we talk about other people. But victory over Amalek represents victory over the works of the flesh. You're in the valley fighting your personal battles. You, you are in the battle doing the, the fight against the flesh. And you must be willing to take a stand against the vices and the temptations of evil. There are addictions that you have to fight. 
Some people have to fight against alcohol or tobacco, others against drugs or pornography, others against this vice or evil or this vice or evil. And, and you have to take a stand and you have to fight against these things. You must be willing to say no to gossiping. You must be willing to say no to complaining and murmuring. You must be willing to say no to drugs and alcohol and pornography and the strong places of evil. You must be willing to fight in the valley, sword to sword, and say, we are going to win this battle. And your pastor must be willing to stand on the mountaintop and intercede on your behalf. And I want to tell you tonight, I'm doing all I can to do that. I spend a lot of time praying in there. I spend a lot of time praying in there. I spend time walking around the sanctuary praying for people. I spend a lot of time in the Bible. I spend a lot of time doing spiritual things on your behalf. I call your name in prayer. And I want you to understand that I am standing on the mountaintop calling your name in prayer, but it doesn't do me any good if you're not willing to get in the valley and also fight. That's right. yes, sir. Amen. That's right. God has never failed us. So if there's failure, it's either going to be on me or on you. And God knew Moses' limitations. God knew that Moses would get weak. So God didn't send him up to the hilltop alone. He went up there with Aaron and her. So he goes up there, and in the beginning, he's strong. He's holding his hands up. But God gave Moses two men who would support him and have the wisdom and the knowledge to support him when he was weak and tired. And God knows my limitations. And I pray that God will always keep me surrounded by people like Aaron and her, who when I cannot stand any longer will put a, a rock for me to sit on. And they will hold my hand up, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And I pray that God surrounds me with those kinds of people. And you also should pray for me that God would surround me with people like Aaron and her who will stand with me and hold my hands up because it's you and it's your children and it's your grandchildren and some of you, your great grandchildren. That's who we're fighting for. And this is why you are going to go through some battles and you're going to need me to be praying on the mountaintop. You're, you're going to need me praying for you. And when you're going through your battles, the last thing you need is for me to be weak and tired and alone. It's okay to be weak and tired. Moses got weak and tired, but he had Aaron and her. But what would have happened if Moses didn't have somebody to support him? You don't want your pastor to be weak and tired and alone. If your pastor ends up weak, tired, and alone, you will also fail in the battle. That's not my opinion. That's about Bible. So you need to fight your battles knowing that God will never fail you. But you also need to do all you can to know and to pray that your pastor is supported. And sometimes you need to be Aaron and her because somebody else is in the valley fighting. And then sometimes you're going to be in the valley fighting. And you need to hope and pray that somebody is Aaron and her standing by my side. Someday you will need somebody fighting for you. So early on, Moses chose Joshua as one of the 12 spies who went into the promised land. And that excursion was incredibly invaluable for the future leader, Joshua. And he held on to those experiences for many years. And when Joshua went into the promised land, he saw the same giants everyone else saw. However, Joshua and Caleb, they saw an enemy they could defeat. While the other 10 men saw victorious giants. Instead of seeing someone that we could take in the battle, they saw someone that would beat them in the battle. And because of this, Moses recognized something victorious in Joshua. Joshua wasn't a naysayer. Joshua wasn't negative. Joshua wasn't a, a oblivious optimistic. He was godly optimistic. 
Moses knew who Joshua was, and so Moses knew that he could count on Joshua, and so he prepared Joshua. But it only worked because Joshua was committed, Joshua was devoted, and Joshua was disciplined. It only worked because Joshua was willing. And we know when the day came that Moses needed to count on someone who would stay in the valley to fight the Amalekites. Moses knew Joshua. So Joshua did what he was supposed to do. And while uh, Moses went up to the mountaintop to do what he was supposed to do, they were both in their place. The weight and the burden of God's people eventually fell from Moses to Joshua when the mantle was passed at the death of Moses. The responsibility the needs and the concerns, all of it passed in one sudden moment. And what should Joshua do? Where could Joshua turn for help? Who would, who would be Joshua to Joshua? Remember, all the older generation was now gone. Moses was gone. Aaron was gone. Hur was gone. Miriam was gone. Phinehas was gone. Everybody else is gone. All the pioneers are gone. Joshua and Caleb were the only two who were left. So the movement could not stop. The church had to go forward. Because a movement that stops and ceases to move forward becomes a monument or it becomes a museum or it becomes a cemetery. But it's no longer a movement. Churches that hold to the past and refuse to move to the future die. Those movements become nothing more than a sign that something did happen at one point in time. Those those things prove that at some point in time, there was something that happened, but all we have now is either a museum or a graveyard. So the next step is for Joshua to say, we have to keep moving forward. And that is to cross the Jordan River. Now, I wasn't there, but I do know that Joshua was a real man, so I... I'm assuming that he had thoughts like this. There's a river in front of us. How am I supposed to move millions of people across the Jordan River? Any wise man would have taken time to consider that. How can I persuade these millions of people to begin a new life in the promised land and to cross this river? And so that's why we have this verse in Joshua 1.8. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That's, that's why we had that verse, because God wanted us to know the reason Joshua would be successful is because he was filled with the word. Joshua came to the realization that while he would always love and always miss Moses, he also understood that just like God was on Moses' side, God was also on Joshua's side, and God uh, uh, gave to Joshua his word. He gave to him his law. He put it in his heart. He put it in his mind. And while he would always love and miss Moses, he no longer had to have him. The mantle had passed from one generation to the next generation. And Joshua had on him from God what Moses had. And Joshua had in his heart, his mind, his soul, his spirit, the word, the law. And because of all that God and Moses had put into Joshua, Joshua had everything he needed to succeed. And the answers are always found in the word of God. The psalmist said in 119, 105, he said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It only happens if you actually put it in your mind. It only happens if you put it in your heart. If the only time you hear the the word of God is when you hear it from this pulpit, that's not enough. You need to be putting the word of God in your heart and into your mind every single day. Joshua's personal courage and wisdom would not be enough for all he would face. 
He, he was a manly man. He was a tough man. He was a strong man. He was a brave man. He was a courageous man. But that would not be enough for all that Josh would face. But God, God's spirit, God's word would always be more than enough for Joshua and the people of Israel. And you and I, we are filled with the Holy Ghost and we can be filled with this word. And when we are, we have what we need to be successful. Amen. Amen. We have what we need to war against the flesh. We have what we need for every chain to be broken. And so we should put as much of God's word into our hearts and into our minds so that we instantly have answers. I don't know how many times in my lifetime where sometime during a day someone would ask me a question and the answer would be the verse I had read that morning. In every victory, in every battle, in every circumstance, in every situation, in every storm, in every good moment and bad moment, the spirit and the word of God will always be enough. But you need to remember this about God's word. In 119.11, he said, thy word have I hid in mine heart. And then he said, I did it for this reason that I might not sin against thee. You, you, you're, you're fighting battles against the flesh. And one of the ways you fight is to put the word of God in your heart. He said, thy word have I hid in my heart because for this reason, so that I will not sin against you, God. Putting the word of God in you does more to help you avoid sin than anything else will in your life. I believe in accountability. I believe that we should have accountability. Do not misunderstand me. But accountability will never do as much for you as the word of God will. In verse 16, he said, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. The only way to make sure you don't forget the word of God is to keep putting it in you. Keep putting it in you. In verse 25, he said, my soul cleaveth unto the dust, quicken thou me according to thy word. You're quickened by what's in you. So if you want to be quickened in your weak moments, when you want to be quickened, when you feel like you're about to die and you need the word of God, the only way that's going to happen is if you've actually put it in you. There is an intentionality that goes with all of this. You must put the word in you. We all remember in Acts 6 and 7 where we see Stephen preaching the gospel. And there were all the religious leaders who rose up against Stephen and they were trying to stop him. And, and Stephen answered all their charges and, and he responded to them in such a magnificent way. And he did so by quoting the ancient scriptures. And in Acts 10, it says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. When you start using scriptures to answer the enemy, they can't answer you. You can use all the logic and the reasoning you want from Aristotle or Socrates or whoever else you want to use. But when you start using scripture, you have the answers. Stephen had so much of the word and of the spirit in him that they could not resist him. They could not ref, uh, refute him. And he, he caused them to lose their minds, to lose their patience. He caused them to lose their tempers. Because they couldn't respond in a logical or an intelligent way. You put enough word in you, you can overcome anything. You put enough word in you and you will know the answers. You put enough uh, of this sword in you and you will be full of wisdom. You'll be full of knowledge. You'll be full of understanding when you put God's word in you. The apostle Peter said this. He said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed 
as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. You have a more sure word of prophecy when you fill yourself with the word of God. And the word of God is the sword that you take in the battle. Overcoming things in life. Having the wisdom and the knowledge of the sword. Being full of the spirit. It, it only makes you stronger. And Joshua... Joshua had the strength he needed to move forward with Israel in the absence of Moses because he was full of the word of God. So Canaan is now in Joshua's vision. Moses wasn't allowed to go. Everyone over the age of 20, when the spies came out of Canaan land and they decided they couldn't do it, none of them were allowed to go. But Canaan is now in Joshua's vision. He's already been there. He knows what they have. And like any great leader, Joshua longed for the people of Israel to have the blessings and the benefits of Canaan. Some of God's people, they're on the edge of the promised land. They started talking about going back to Egypt. What foolish thinking. What foolish thinking. They started talking about going back to slavery. Egypt represents the world. And going back to Egypt is the same thing as backsliding. Going back to Egypt is the same thing as falling into perversion and pollution of sin. Going back to Egypt is, is allowing yourself to be bound by the chains of sin again. And Joshua did not want that for any of God's people. Joshua wanted the promised land. Joshua wanted Canaan land. Joshua wanted the land of milk and honey, not just for himself. He wanted it for all of Israel. Joshua wanted Canaan and all of its blessings and all of its benefits for the people of God. Joshua wanted victory. And when Joshua led God's people to the Jordan River, Joshua placed he had the different men place 12 stones from the wilderness in the middle of the riverbed. He's, he had these 12 stones brought and placed right in the middle of the riverbed. And they stood there and they had all the people go by. And the priest stood there in the middle of the riverbed and everyone goes by. And as soon as all the people had arrived on the other side of Jordan, in the promised land, Joshua built another memorial. He built another memorial on the other side of the river with 12 stones taken from the riverbed, taken from the place of the water. This was a memorial that they had crossed over Jordan. This was marking in their hearts and in their minds. It was marking on their lives that they were going into a new day, that they were going into a new time, that everything was changing, that everything was going to be different now. And Jordan was the death of the old and, and the beginning of the new. Jordan was the line in the sand. Jordan was the, the place where they marked. We were in the wilderness, but now we're in the promised land. And so they get to the other side of Jordan, and guess what? They didn't just throw a caution to the wind. They didn't start just letting go of everything. They didn't say, oh, the things of God's law were in the wilderness. They were the old things. No. The first thing Joshua did, he said, all the men have to be circumcised. Everyone needs to be baptized. Baptism is the circumcision of the heart. We don't drop that. We don't drop that. And then, this is so cool. Joshua 5, 11, it says, And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow. After they had eaten of the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna anymore. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan, 
that year. Everything was changing. Nothing was going to be the same ever again. They weren't going back to Egypt. They weren't going back to the wilderness. They weren't going to have manna anymore. They were going to have to have some new shoes now. And everything was changing. And it was the will of God for everything to change. But remember this. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until all the doubters and all the complainers had died. Only the houses of Joshua and Caleb survived the wilderness because they are the ones who had faith in God. But all the faithless people failed in the wilderness. The complainers were gone. The doubters died. The unbelievers were left behind in graves. The gossipers were buried in the sand. They all died in the wilderness. And then Israel moved forward. And so tonight I want to tell you, don't die in the wilderness. Don't die in the wilderness. Make up your mind that you're going to be like Joshua. Make up your mind you're going to be like Caleb. Make up your mind in your heart, your soul, your spirit. You're going to be a fighter. You're going to be a believer. We need some fighters. We need some people who say, yeah, we went through the wilderness. Yeah, we ate manna. But it's a new day. It's a new time. And, and sure, the people in the wilderness had some blessings. They saw some miracles. They had manna. They had water from the rock. And that was all well and good for those who were in the wilderness. But for the next generation, God gave them corn and gave them strength to change from being wanderers in the wilderness to being victorious fighting soldiers. We need some fighters. And they needed that change. They needed that change because they were coming up on Jericho. And there were no things like Jericho in the wilderness. So verse 13 says, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. That he lifted up his eyes. And he looked and behold. There stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said, art thou for us? Or for our adversaries, who are you and whose side are you on? And the man responds, nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? Joshua recognized. This wasn't just any ordinary man. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship him and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto this servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. You see, Joshua recognized that all the responsibility for God's people was in God's hands, not Joshua's hands. All Joshua had to do was obey. All Joshua had to do was listen. All Joshua had to do was whatever God asked him to do. All the responsibility of God's people was in God's hands. The responsibility of this church is in God's hands. The responsibility of this church is in God's hands. All the responsibility of First Pentecostal Church of Marion is in the hands of God. Amen? Amen. Aren't you thankful? The battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. It's not my battle. It's not yours. It's the Lord's. And Joshua had to just trust in God. That's all he had to do. Because when you trust in God, I promise you, and the word promises you, that you will be victorious. You just got to trust in God. And we are living this life here, fighting our battles. But we need to understand that there's a promised land in the by and by. On the other side of that crystal sea, there's coming a day when you and I will enter into the promised land. But it's only going to happen if we're willing to be fighters. Paul told us in Ephesians 1.3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And we face different enemies than Joshua faced. And none of us here tonight, none of us fight the same battles. If we took the time this evening and asked everyone to share what battles they were fighting, all of us would have a different story to tell. 
And Joshua had to face different things also. Early in his leadership, he had the Battle of Jericho. This was a major battle. It was a major victory. The walled city of Jericho was a formidable enemy, and, and Joshua could not move forward without a victorious battle against Jer Jericho. Because, you see, you can't rule over a kingdom you haven't conquered. And the only way that the Israelites were going to rule over Jericho was to conquer Jericho. The enemy does not care if you're young or old. The enemy doesn't care if you're new to the job. The enemy does not care if you've been living for Jesus for many years or just one day. You're going to fight some major battles. You could get up from this altar, get up from speaking in tongues, and be filled with joy and victory and walk out that door and be attacked by the enemy. The enemy doesn't care. You're going to fight some major battles in your life, and you need to be willing to fight. But you also need to be willing to to go ahead and fight those battles because there's something about having a victory. There's something about winning. You need to fight and you need to win and you need to subdue the kingdoms that come against you. But then you have other types of battles because not too long after Jericho, Israel and Joshua, they were defeated by I. The problem was this little kingdom, I, seemed to be so insignificant that Joshua and the Israelites thought, we don't need God for this one. We can take these people. It will never matter how awesome you are. It will no matter how, never matter how awesome you think you are. It will never matter how small you may believe the problem is. You need to always, always, always choose to depend on God. The smallest of problems can take you down if you try to do it on your own. Joshua made decisions without prayer. And he lost to this lesser foe, I. And to make matters worse, one individual... Of the millions of Israelites chose to disobey God. A man by the name of Achan decided to hide some spoils from the Jericho battle back in his tent. And God revealed this to Joshua. And so I want to say to you this. Let God lead you to remove some people from your life. You don't have to be rude or mean. You can find nice ways to separate yourself from people who bring you down. Let God take care of people. Pray about people that are uh, in your life that shouldn't be there. There are people who just do not need to be in your life. Achan didn't need to be in the Israelite camp. Jezebel certainly didn't need to be among the kingdom. There are some people you just don't need in your life. And Achan died. But the problem is this. Achan didn't die alone. Soldiers died in that battle against I because of Achan. He didn't die alone. Achan's sin caused fellow soldiers to die in that battle. Having an Achan in your circle brings death to people in your circle. Be so connected to God so that you can appropriately, kindly, and considerately separate yourself from people like Achan. Now, you, you need to make sure you heard me correctly. I said kindly, sweetly, politely, consider, considerably, trying to think of another adjective. I've ran out of them. You don't need to go be mean. There's enough devils in the world. We don't need you to be mean. But Joshua also came across some people who were deceivers. You see, not every, not every enemy that came at Joshua came as an obvious enemy. See, the Gibeonites came at Joshua as a friend. The Gibeonites came along and they wanted to offer an alliance to Joshua. And they promised to submit themselves to Joshua and to submit the, uh, uh, to his leadership. 
And again, Joshua failed to talk to God about the Gibeonites. And if he had prayed about them, he would have known that they were trying to deceive him. So pray about every single person in your life. With every person with whom you spend time or give yourself to, you need to be praying about it. The Apostle Paul told us to pray that we would not be deceived. And the Gibeonites, they fooled Joshua, and it cost Israel a great deal, a great deal. Many generations later, we're still suffering because Joshua was fooled by the Gibeonites. Some mistakes that people made years ago still cost us today. And mistakes that you and I make today will cost our children and our grandchildren. So you need to pray about every single person in your life. Don't let anybody in your life without prayer. Sometimes it feels like everything is going wrong at the same time. It feels like the, the whole world is caving in on you and the natural tendency is to panic and to run in fear. We are tempted to think or even believe that God has abandoned us. Because in Joshua chapter 10, verse 7, these 10 southern kings, they came up against Joshua. And so Joshua ascended from Gilgal. He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them in Azekah and unto Machedah. And in verse 11, it says, and it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. And now look at this. It says, they were more which died with hailstones, more died from what was coming from heaven than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So when you feel everybody's coming against you and you feel like the 10 kings of the south have, have come up against you. You see, when Joshua and the men of Israel, they pursued the enemy and they had done all they could do. God stepped into the battle and did great and miraculous things and caused hailstones to fall from heaven and to finish off the battle. You can do all you want to do, but as long as you trust in God and stay in the battle and be willing to fight, you can know that God is going to come through with a miracle. But you got to be a fighter. There will be divine intervention when you need it. Be who you're supposed to be. Do what you're supposed to do. And let God do the miraculous. Fill yourself with the word. Open up your heart, your soul, your mind to be filled with the spirit. And fight. And fight. We need fighters. And watch God take the battle. They had, they had to fight a lot of battles. But sometimes God tells you this, like you said in Second Chronicles. Sometimes God will say, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. He didn't say sit down. He said set yourselves. In other words, prepare yourself. And then he says, stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. He didn't say sit down and rest and watch the show. He said, prepare yourself. See the salvation of the Lord and go fight. A lot of times we like to Say, you shall not need to fight in this battle. And that's where we stop. But that's not the whole verse. The whole verse is, you're going to have to go out to the battle, but God's going to do the fighting for you. But you still got to go out there. God's not going to answer prayers you haven't prayed. God's not going to take over your will. He's not going to usurp your will from you. He gave you that freedom so that you could have your own will. 
And you need to use that will to be more like Joshua. You need to be willing to fight in the valley while I'm praying on the mountain. When I'm in, in there praying or in there praying or down here praying, you need to be willing to be fighting against the flesh. You need to be willing to fill your heart, your mind with God's word. Fill your life with his spirit. And at the end of Joshua's life, he told the Israelites, he said, if it, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served with, that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. So here at the end of Joshua's life, the end of his life, he's saying, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He didn't say, he's at the end of his life and he didn't say, we did serve the Lord. He said, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Joshua was talking to God's people. He was speaking to the Israelites. And Joshua was, was telling these people, he said, you must choose this. He was telling them, this isn't going to happen by accident. You're not going to accidentally bring people to church. You have to choose to do that. Now, the people that you try to bring may not come, and God will bring other people in their place, but that's not an accident. You're not going to accidentally teach Bible studies. It may not be the way you planned. But if you're trying to do it, God will open up doors for you to do it. None of this that we see tonight in these scriptures are going to happen by accident. None of it's just going to occur. It's, it's, it's a thing that you have to choose. You have to choose to be a fighter. You have to choose to fight. You have to choose to talk to God. You have to choose to be holy. You have to choose to be righteous. You have to choose to be sanctified. You have to choose to give your life to God. You have to choose to fight. You have to choose to be victorious. Amen. When I look at Joshua, I look at an amazing man. In my mind, Joshua's big and powerful. Joshua's intimidating. In my mind, Joshua's athletic and, and wise. Saul stood head and shoulders above everyone. Saul was athletic. In many ways, Saul was very knowledgeable and intelligent. But Saul depended on Saul. And Saul died by his own sword. Joshua depended on God.